Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I am the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. And with me today is one of the engineers on my team, Cameron Guerra. Welcome, Cam. Hey, Taylor. It's good to be with you. Uh, well, today is a special episode of Haskell Weekly. We have a guest. Uh, we have someone else from our team here at IT Pro TV. Sarah, how's it going today, Sarah? It's going good. Thank you all for having me. Well, awesome, Sarah. So excited to have you here today with us. Um, it's also an exciting month uh, in the world of open source uh, because it's Hacktoberfest, uh, which means we have a lot of opportunities to commit and contribute to open source projects that are going on all over uh, the world. So, you know, if you check it out, uh, it's at hacktoberfest.digitalocean.com. And there you can kind of figure out what it's all about and get get started uh, and you know maybe even get a free t-shirt if you're able to contribute what they need. Anything for a free t-shirt. Exactly, Sarah. Well, here at Haskell Weekly, we wanted to share a project called Learn for Haskell that is actually a part of the Hacktoberfest uh, event. And it's gonna give you the opportunity to get more familiar with Haskell and also get that free t-shirt I was talking about earlier. Um, but you know, that's about it for the events and things that are going on um, from our side. But, you know, today we have uh, some really great content. So, uh, Taylor, what are we talking about today? Today we're going to be talking about getting recursively drunk with monoids, Woo-hoo! which is a blog post by Simon Shine. And this is really exciting because we're in the spookiest month. And what's spookier than a recursive cocktail? I can't think of anything. Mm, love me some recursive cocktails. That was uh, you know, Friday night. Definitely got hit with that. Take a drink and then you take another drink. That's recursion, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, but for me, you know, someone else was pouring the beer on the other side, so it just kept coming. <laughs> gotta, gotta funnel it every once in a while. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's true. We decided to dig into this blog post because we like semi-groups and monoids, uh, but this is a really lighthearted take on it, even though it is still informative, so you can laugh and learn at the same time. It's definitely the funniest blog post I've read in 2020. Every good blog post should include a Rick and Morty joke, in my opinion. Yeah, Uh, that's kind of a low bar to clear for 2020, though. I mean, (laughs) there's not a lot of good stuff going on in this year. (laughs) But this is one of them. But this blog post is a shining star. Very true. As you can guess from the title, this blog post is about monoids and also about semigroups, which are, you know, a related concept. But I think those can sometimes scare people away, and I'm curious... Cam, do you feel like the first time you heard about semigroups and monoids, were you scared or were you like, what is that? Yeah, it was uh, a little bit of both. Uh, you know, there's inquisitive side of it. Uh, you know, I never really heard about it uh, and I never really had an experience. So, you know, it's that mystery. What is it? Uh, and, you know, coming to read this blog post and the actual the blog post that inspired this one, which, you know, is in the you know, Getting Recursively Drunk with Monoids post, uh, it kind of allowed me to kind of just get a good firm definition of what um, semi-groups and monoids are, um, which semi-groups are a way to combine two items. And you know, in Haskell, we have, oh, we can derive an instance for that, whether it be custom or just via deriving, like we talked about last week in the Haskell Weekly Podcast. And, you know, that allows us to you know, merge various maps and different data structures that have a lot of commonality, but we don't want to have to always do the boilerplate around that. So, uh, you know, that was really cool. And, you know, one fact about the uh, semi-group is it carries over the law of associativity. So uh, in mathematics, you've probably experienced that or, you know, learned about it in algebra, uh, kind of that fun stuff that we all learned back in sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And, you know, sometimes we forget and when we're programming, we're like, oh yeah, that's uh Real nice. So, yeah, and just in case anybody has forgotten since sixth grade or whenever they learned it in the first time, associativity is where if you want to add, like, let's say x plus y plus z, it doesn't matter if you do x plus y first or y plus z first. Um, And it can be instructive to think about things that aren't associative. So, like division, it matters which one you do first. Um, But with addition, it doesn't. So, you're free to do them in any order. And that's what a semi group requires you to be able to do right and then we've got monoid which allows you to have a default implementation for a semi group so 
you know, when you're dealing with a map, you can merge a map that has items and a, merge, and a map that has nothing. And mono is kind of what allows you to do that. Um, and so, yeah. Ye old Mempty. Mm, empty. Mm, empty. I, you know, whenever my stomach hits empty, I got to hit the, the pantry and make sure I got some food. <laughs> Especially with. You got to exactly. pin some food in there, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All, all about them monoids and, and some agrees. If you've got a empty tummy, you got to pen some snacks. Mm hmm. Or some of Sarah's delicious cookies. <clears throat> Ship them to me. <laughs> uh, um, soon. <clears throat> <laughs> but, anyways, back to this blog post. Um, yeah, so, so Taylor, you know, kind of dive in more. What, what was the the big talk? I think the big idea here was that uh, if you squint a little bit, you can model cocktails as monoids. And uh, I have to say, as somebody who has made a handful of mixed drinks myself, it, there's some questions lingering on if you can really do this or not. But I'll, I'll ride with it for this post, you know. Uh, so when they say a cocktail can be modeled as a monoid, um, we have to kind of meet all of the things that we just laid out. We have to be able to combine cocktails associatively, and we have to have an empty cocktail. Now, the the empty cocktail is real easy um, because it's just nothing, no cocktail. But you gotta be careful when combining your cocktails. Remember, beer before liquor, never sicker, liquor before beer, in the clear. Or you end up with a Molotov cocktail. You know, that's (laughs) also very dangerous. I, I hope we're not talking about that type of cocktail in this post. I mean, who knows? These seem like the drinkable ones, to be fair. Gin and tonic is usually for drinking. Molotov, I believe, is for lighting things on fire. Mm. Yeah, I, I gotta re watch The Good Place to make sure I understand that. Mortals! <laughs> to be fair, though... Jackson Beal! This post is definitely lighting a fire in us. So it's <laughs> in this our conversation. Molotov cocktail. <laughs> Right, it's sparking this conversation. Exactly. It all comes back. Well, anyways, we, we've got cocktails. We're talking about real drinking cocktails here, right? One that has a name, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. Sex on the Beach or, uh, gosh, uh, Rum and Coke. You know, old fashioned. Old fashioned gin and tonic, oh, ooh, like one. Sarah said earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and this one actually talks a lot about gin and tonic and lemon. Mojito. I don't. <gasps> Mojito. That's actually in the Mojito. underlying post which Mm -hmm. good stuff the underlying post was so funny because the idea of combining a mojito and the rum drink sounds disgusting (laughs) like you can do it (laughs) in code but if you physically combine those drinks to ingest that would be very gross oh yeah we're we're not saying that if you am a pin two cocktails you're going to end up with a good cocktail just that (laughs) it is still technically a cocktail yeah i mean i'm just not sure that guy was 21 yet so he probably hasn't tried it yet Good yeah, point. this is all in theory, theoretical cocktails. Right. But anyway, so they've got name and ingredients, which they kind of talk about in this post. Um, you know, and there's something called the super drink, which I don't know what the heck that is. Yeah, this is from some Dutch computer science paper. Uh, I could not read it, but it looked very entertaining. You know, the Dutch, they can have a good time. Apparently they're drinking super drinks. So what is a super drink? I, I still don't know. You didn't <laughs> answer the question. I mean, I read the post. Well, I don't speak Dutch, so I couldn't read the post. The post lays it out here as one part gin, two parts lemon, and three parts super drink. What is So a super drink contains super drink, and this is where the recursion comes in. Oh my gosh. (laughs) My mind is blown. It's just super drinks all the way down. Wowzers. Sure is. Yeah, I I mean, not gonna lie. Missed that this whole time I've read this blog post, like four times. Still didn't click, which... I gotta, I gotta slow down and work on my. Um... Slow down, pour yourself a super drink, and then understand super drinks. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Anywho, um, so last week we talked about deriving, right? Kawainik, uh wrote a blog post and you know very great detail about it, and we talked about that um, in the previous edition, and you know, our, we're talking about semi groups and monoids. Which have which are type classes in Haskell, and could we derive these things? So, sort of. For the semi group instance, unfortunately, we couldn't because the way that they chose to represent ingredients behind the scenes is a map from the particular ingredient, like gin, 
to the amount, like one part or two parts. And when you want to combine two sets of ingredients, you have to add those together. So if you have one cocktail that has one part gin in it and another cocktail that has two parts gin, you want to end up with three parts gin. Hopefully everyone can follow that math. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you use the derived instance for semi-group, since they're using maps behind the scenes, maps will uh, just pick one of those to win. So if your one part gin drink was the quote unquote first one, then your result would only have one part gin. So you'd be dropping some parts of your cocktail. So you uh, would not be able to derive that part, unfortunately. But the monoid part, you could because the empty cocktail is the same as the empty map. So we're good there. I mean, I think the empty cocktail means give me some more. <laughs> Isn't this a recursive function? Doesn't this never end? <laughs> the infinity cocktail. I like it. Mm, good stuff. The super drink. <laughs> it is the infinite cocktail. Get you that super drink. Or drunk. Gets you super drunk. Yeah. yeah sorry. Missed it's good to remember there. that uh, empty cocktails are always empty for them empty, but you have to do something special so that you get all the parts of your cocktail together. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a very good thing to point out because the derived instances are handy, but it means you're getting the default behavior. And here we need something other than the default. So yeah, th thanks Taylor for that information. What about, you know, kind of normalizing part of the combination? They, they talked about this in the blog post. Could you expand a little bit on how they resolved it and what their, you know, you know they had a hypothesis and what, what was the result that ended up happening? When they're talking about normalizing for cocktails, what they're talking about is taking a recipe that says something like two parts gin to four parts lemon and reducing it into something that's equivalent but hopefully simpler like one part gin, two parts lemon, because you probably wouldn't give a recipe to someone that is more complicated than it needs to be because if they're drinking these super drinks, they're going to need things to be simple so that they can follow along. Mm. Well, my margarita mix that I have on the fridge does say two parts, uh, wow. Tequila. Tequila, thank you. And four parts mix. So Margarita mix. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously that manufacturer didn't understand that they could you know, simplify it, and, and maybe they didn't want to because of what they found out in this blog post. It turns out that normalizing has some gotchas because we've been talking about combining things and in particular being able to combine them in any order. You can't normalize after you combine because it may change the thing that you get at the end. So if you're trying to combine three cocktails together, it will you'll get a different result if you combine the first two and then the third one or the second two and then the first one. And that's because this normalization step removes some of that information from these cocktail recipes. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't get as good of a drink. Well, at least we figured out what a super drink is. Uh, you know, at the end of this, they've actually ran the function and created what is apparently the super drink, which is 182 parts gin, 121 parts lemon, and holy cow, that's a lot of alcohol. <laughs> Enough for a party. Yeah, we did the math, and uh, this comes out to about eight liters or two gallons of gin. And I don't know about you, I have a relatively well-stocked bar, but I don't have two gallons of gin in my bar. You don't just keep two gallons of gin on hand? Not even around Christmas. I mean, I don't think you would remember where you put the gin or where you would get gin <laughs> after drinking that much gin. So... That's very fair. I think it's a good thing you don't have two gallons of gin laying around. Sadly, it means I will not be able to create and then sample one of these super drinks. Yeah, we need you at work on Monday, and I think you'd still be out of it <laughs> if you had a sip now. I don't think you'd be back for Monday's work. I, I agree. I wouldn't be back. I know what our next engineering hangout should consist of, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> we'll just do a shot of super drink. How about that? That way, exactly. you know, we don't have... We, yeah. Maybe we'll see if we can do some simplification here. Doesn't seem like it's mm -hmm. going to be possible, but, you know, we'll, we'll find out. But, yeah, so, you know, in you know, this is a fun, contrived example of, you know, semi-group instances and what they do and how they work. But for us, in our day-to-day -day at IT Pro, as, you know, web application developers and API engineers, you know, we deal with this a lot because we have you know, various metrics that need to be combined. Um, so, you know, if someone's watching a video at IT Pro TV, you know, we need to know, you know, figure out how to merge two events that have occurred. So they've watched 
30 seconds and 30 seconds, oh, they've actually watched a minute of IT Pro TV. And so, you know, we have those, you know, semi-group examples uh, that we actually, I don't think we have any customization, but I could be wrong. Taylor, do we have any customization there? I don't know that I would call it customization, but these types that we have, like you mentioned, for amount of time that a user has watched an episode, they're effectively wrappers around integers, but integers don't have a, a semi-group instance or a monoid instance because there are multiple possibilities. You could choose addition or multiplication. So really what we're doing is choosing addition for these instances and then using that. Right, so we're not doing anything super fancy, but it's super practical and helpful for us when trying to merge these things together. Sweet. Yeah, and one of the upsides here is that we don't define that many semi-group instances in our code base, but we use a lot of functions that rely on semi-group instances. So things like, you know, fold map or uh, that's the only one that immediately comes to mind, but stuff like that where we don't have to write all these little utility functions to smush a bunch of these values together. They're already there for us. Yeah, and, you know, I think that you bring up a good point there about, like, Semigroups are great to merge generally two things together, but if you have a list of things, you probably want to reach for a foldable instance, um, which you know will allow you to kind of create the same merging, but over a larger list of uh, whatever it may be. Yeah, so if you had a list of cocktails, like maybe an entire cocktail recipe book, and you wanted to combine them all into one cocktail, that's that's where you need foldable. Yeah, I don't, I think, I think that would be illegal in the lower 48 states. <laughs> well, anywho, well, thank, thanks for sharing that stuff. And, you know, we want to give you some you know, real world examples from a, from a contrived example. Uh, and, you know, I think we've got a good idea of what semi-group and monoid are now and how to, to apply them and use them. Um, and yeah, I mean, do you have anything else to add here, Taylor? I think that'll about do it for me. How about you, Sarah? Uh, same. This has been very fun. I feel like we've learned a lot about semi-groups and monoids and also about cocktails. So very informative mm -hmm. podcast day. Win, win, win. All right, y'all. Well, thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I've been your host, Taylor Fossack, and with me today was Cameron Guerra and Sarah Lichtenstein. If you're interested in learning more about Haskell Weekly, please check out our website, which is haskellweekly.news. Or you can check us out on social media. Our Twitter handle is Haskell Weekly. Our Reddit username, also Haskell Weekly. And if you want to contribute to the Haskell Weekly newsletter, or you have a blog post that you'd like us to talk about here on the podcast, please let us know on GitHub and our GitHub username, once again, Haskell Weekly. Nice. Awesome. Well, and also, you know, we want to thank our sponsor, IT Pro TV, for allowing us to create this podcast. And if you're you know, interested in learning more about IT Pro TV and subscribing to you know, the content we have available, we would love to offer you a coupon code. And the coupon code is Haskell Weekly 30, which will give you 30% off all of our memberships. And we'll be able to give you access to an entire library of IT content. So please check it out. There's a free subscription as well if you'd like to kind of sample and see what's available. Um, but we would like to just give a shout out to them and all the incredible things they do. And we're just so grateful that they let us do a podcast like this. Very much so. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week. Peace. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>